Yeah, well, you know, when we first determined that we were going to not go back to Rapture, that uh, as a studio we had sort of said wh what we wanted to say about Rapture, um, we, you know, we kicked around the idea of just like, what if we were to keep the core principles of Bioshock, but r which, you know, and for us, those core principles have always been two things. The core principles are that you have um, a very improvisational way of doing combat, meaning you have weapons in one hand and powers, you know, whether they're plasmids in the first game or vigors in this game in the other hand and character growth in your body and um, a, a, a lot of improvisational elements in the world as well. You know, that was the one core element we thought made Bioshock. And the other core element was having a very detailed, rich environment that was both fantastical, but also um, very grounded in reality. Um, you know, and so once we felt if we kept those elements, it would very much be a Bioshock game, but everything else was really up for grabs at that point. And, um, you know, the first thing we said was, what if we went into a very different time period? And, um, you know, the, the turn of the century was very attractive to us. A bunch of guys had, in the team had read a book called Devil in the White City, and they had turned me on to it, and, um, which is about the 1893 World's Fair, um, which is an amazing book. And um, that period started really drawing us in. And if you looked at the sort of art of that period, you know, especially the sci-fi art of that period, there was always these images of cities in the sky. Uh, the people, they thought they'd be living in cities in the sky because at that time, um, the world had changed so much technologically in the last, in the, in the 20 year period around there. Um, you know, in that 20 year period, these are some of the things that were introduced, electricity, airplanes, phonograph records, movies, cars, you know, the list goes on and on, all these transformative technologies. So if you ask somebody back then, well, might we be living in cities in the sky in 10 years? They probably would have said, well, maybe, you know, that sounds reasonable. And um, so you have all this great art about, about these cities, and that just really inspired us. And that was really the starting point. You know, then we sort of had to turn that into, you know, Columbia and the specifics of, you know, Booker and Elizabeth and all those other things that make Bioshock Infinite, Bioshock Infinite. Yeah, you know, in any Bioshock game, I think what's really important is you give the player a lot of agency about how they approach any particular problem in the game that they can... You know, one, you're talking to your friend the next day at the water cooler and you're saying, well, oh, you, know, you, you, you shot down the Zeppelin from the ground. We know what? I got on the skyline and I rode up to that Zeppelin and I got on board and I blew it up from inside and then dived out of it. And those are all valid approaches. You know, even in the most sort of day-to-day -day combat in Bioshock Infinite, you know, you know what, well, what weapons are you using? What vigors are you using? How is your character loaded out, you know, in terms of the, um, of the nostrums inside of them, which sort of is our, you know, RPG growth system. And, um, and that's, you know, what I think people expect out of a Bioshock game. And I think it's what they're, you know, they're used to, whether it's in Rapture or Columbia. And um, I think the addition of the character Elizabeth and her ability to open these things called tears in the world, which are sort of windows to other realities, where if you're in a combat space, she can change that very combat space so she can bring in allies, say, or she can bring in cover where there's no cover or new weapons or a turret to defend you or all these other elements. And, um, but she only can do, like say if there's, there's, you might see five potential things in a space she could bring in, but she can only bring in two of those. Or you might see three earlier in the game and she can only bring in one of those. You have to make choices even about how you define the combat space you're in. The story is very much about Booker and Elizabeth's um, coming together in their journey through Columbia. And, you know, Elizabeth's story in particular is about trying to extricate herself from this, in prison, essentially, she's lived in since she was a little girl. And this guardian she has, guardian slash jailer, um, called the Songbird, who's this huge, you know, 20 foot, 30, 20, 30 foot mechanical bird creature. Um, well, we don't, it's actually actually clear whether he's mechanical or there's something living inside of him. Um, and, um, you know, I think there is, there is this, this, this heaviness hanging over both of them. And, you know, I think it's particularly demonstrated in the demo where Elizabeth says to Booker, if we get to a situation where the songbird's gonna take me back to this prison, I want you to, to kill me instead of going back. It's that important to her that she have the ability to control her own destiny. And yet there's definitely a sense that this is hanging over them throughout the game. And it's a very, they're in a very dark place throughout this game. You know, they're both, you know, having this amazing adventure at the same time. Um, 
you know, going on skylines, getting these amazing combats and getting to know each other and sort of building this intense bond with each other. But they're also, you know, they're, everybody's out to get them. So it's kind of a really um, intense experience for them. And I think players as Booker will, you know, hopefully be really drawn into, you know, not just what's going on in the gameplay and the combat, but actually forming a relationship with this NPC, which is, you know, it's very challenging to do that. But I think we've set up the goal for ourselves, and you know, it's going to be up to the players to decide how well we succeeded with that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, in terms of you know, any other game, Skyrim or whatever, taking you know, quote, inspiration from us, there is a constant back and forth. Like you know, if if Todd Howard and his team have taken an ounce of inspiration from us, I'm sure we've taken a pound of inspiration from them. Um, you know, there we always look to our colleagues and our peers for inspiration and ideas and you know as a gamer myself I, I think that um, I play um, you know I play games all the time you know I, I don't have I don't have um, you know I go to work and I go home and I spend time with my wife and I play games and that's really a lot of my life maybe that's kind of sad but that's you know that's that's a lot of that's a lot of my life and you know I'm always excited you know especially like this season you, know, you have all these games coming out. Um, you know, guys, I, all these guys I know and all these guys I admire, and I'm lucky enough to sort of be able to hang out with these guys and know them and then go and see these amazing worlds they create. So, you know, there's a, I hope, you know, I believe there's a constant back and forth. Certainly, I know I'm inspired by um, my colleagues and my peers, and my team's inspired by them. And, you know, if they're inspired by us, that's, you know, you know that's very honoring and flattering. Yeah, you know, we, we have this, um, we have this show, um, a podcast we do called Irrational Interviews, and one of the best things about my job is that, you know, I have this idea for the show, it's like, well, what if I could use uh, my position to basically get people to come, that I admire, to come talk to me? And so, you know, we have this show, and Cl Cliff Lezinski was on, and Todd Howard was on, and we just had Guillermo del Toro on, and uh, Zack Snyder, and all these great people, and I just basically get to nerd out with them and talk to them about what they do, and they talk to me about what I do. And, you know, that's probably one of the highlights of my last, you know, year and a half is really, even besides working on Infinite, is spending time talking to, you know, my peers. Because honestly, we don't, unlike like the, the movie business, we're not all in the same city. And so we don't get to, like, run into each other all the time. So, you know, it's always a great, you know, whenever a chance, where you, whether you're a GDC or E3, the um, problem is you're so busy at those things. So you don't even, even if you can bump into each other, it's usually very brief. Um, so it's really great to have a chance to sit down with these guys and chat with them.